This is the uh, Inside Tonight, and we have a panel of very, very interesting experts. Uh, Reverend Agola, the church has been vocal about some of these issues and challenges in society under this regime. We've seen that. Do you believe the president's commitment to address economic hardship, like uh, you had asked for, police brutality and governance issues, do you believe th these commitments uh, were sufficiently addressed in his speech to the nation, or were they more rhetorical? Well, thank you, Victor. Um, I would want to start with uh, what Ambassador said about um, communication. You may have a very good um, vision for something very important that you'd want to achieve within your, you know, your time and tenure in office. But um, if you do not define governance to yourself and know that governance means three things. One is leadership, meaning the one with the vision. And you cannot implement a vision. A vision has to be taken through stages. And the second stage after you've, you have that vision is to give it structures. And this is what tells you how it can be implemented. And then you now get it to the implementers. So there is leadership in governance, there is administration in governance, and there are managers in governance. Mm -hmm. When you come down to do what you have already delegated structurally, within your policies. There's a problem. Then there is a problem. And that's what the prof here has called micromanagement. Mm. What we see sometimes with our president is micromanagement. Why is that so, sir? Why, why do you think that is so? When you, is it, is it when you other people are incompetent or what? When you begin to micromanage, then we question whether you appointed the right people. Mm. We also question whether you appointed the right people but you are not listening to their pieces of advice to you. Because when you appoint people like PSS, what are they supposed to do? They are supposed to be your experts. They are supposed to be the people who tell you this is what you need to do where. And, and so either you appoint the wrong people or you are the wrong person in managing what you have already appointed. As a leader, you need to be bold enough to face an administrator mm -hmm. and tell the administrator, what are you doing with my vision? Mm -hmm. And you face the manager down there and say, what are you doing with my vision? So coming to endeavor to explain to us what is happening, and yet you did not do the synthesization of what you had visioned, then it becomes so difficult. For example, if I would ask uh, anybody who is uh, viewing us today and uh, who will have a, a, you know, a moment of listening to what we said, uh, what's the difference between NHIF and SHIF? Some people had just said, uh, you know, in the TikTok and wherever, that it is just, you know, removing N and replacing it with S, with S which, which is not the reality. The reality is that SHIF is a broader health cover and is something that is meant to be good. But who has told Kenyans what it is? And why rush it before you even tell us? If you have not done the synthesization and, and you have not brought it you know, to the people, then how come you begin to rush the implementation? NHIF, NHIF means National Hospital Insurance Fund. Correct. The other one means what? That's Therein sure. lies the question. So if you cannot uh, notice the difference, the difference. <clears throat> and you still say, and, and I heard the president say, say, say the same thing, he confused the two. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Social Health Insurance Fund. Mm -hmm. 
That's a different, a different arrangement. Completely. And this arrangement has to be given to the people in a language they can understand so that they can support your vision. If leaders in this country cannot notice the difference, then it means something has failed. Mm. There was a time, I remember, when the president had uh, some, um, some uh, uh, address to the nation from, from his house. Uh, he said that I am disappointed by my communication team. Now, how can they disappoint you? And one of us have, has just said, why are you using the same old method of communication? in this age and era. There is a way to communicate. Today and even now as we speak, many people are not asleep, not, uh, uh, not because they are doing something very important, but because they are on their phones. That's right. <laughs> so if you wanted to communicate something. You could. Easily. You could, very easily. Mm. It should be popping as a sponsored uh, advert. Yeah. And, and people will be reading and saying, oh, what is this? Mm -hmm. Can I know what, what this is? So this culture of micromanagement mm -hmm. and this culture of not listening to the people you appointed on issues of finance, on issues of health, these are technocrats. All right. I cannot be everything in everywhere. All right. I can only do so much. All right. All right, all right. I think you, you raised some interesting questions. I want to bring you in, Dr. Jambo. There, there was a point in, in, in the speech where there was some focus on uh, subsidized fertilizers and increased agricultural yields. How can stakeholders like researchers such as yourselves and innovators be able to take this or amplify this message of sustainable agricultural productivity? If you may, you know, it may not necessarily be your sector, but as a researcher, how can, how can people plug into this and take it to the next level? How can people like you take this uh, confusion or even the, the dysfunction in the health sector to actually take it to the next level as stakeholders? Okay, well, one of the things is we need to make research applicable. We need more applied research. So what we need to do is ensure that research institutions, universities, and where possible TVETs are working not just in isolation on what we call esoteric research, research that just remains on a shelf, mm. but actually are linking research to community and to industry so that the outcomes of research can be applied and can be, in quotes, replicated or go to scale. So whether it's agriculture or health, who is the user of your research and how can industry help you to take it to scale? Now, when it comes to the issues of agriculture, one of the things we need to do now is to make sure that we make it more appealing for young people. We want them to go back and farm. So whatever we're doing in terms of applying research for young people, we need to make sure that it's tech savvy and that perhaps it uses AI and that young people can access solutions on their mobile handsets. Therefore, we'll be able to research and apply research in a state where young people are involved in the universities. We also need to ensure that young people can go to class and do their research by linking them to places such as, for example, Konza, Technopolis, where we are supporting young people who have small startup ideas that they want to take to scale. So you talk about research and you learn about it in your class, and then you go to a place you can, where you can Those take your idea. Those we're talking about. Yes, yeah. and incubate it and have someone there mentor you so that you commercialize your outcomes and then take them to scale, and someone to tell you where you can market them. Because we have lots of good ideas, but where do we market them? In this way, we'll be able to help young people go from education to applied engagement in communities. That's something that we need to look at. But talking about research, I want to go back to information and data. And you mentioned that some of the things that are bedeviling the health sector now are the processing of claims. And one of the things the president brought to the table was digital health. And someone has mentioned digitization even in foreign policy. Mm -hmm. But when we digitize our health sector, we make it easier to pay claims. We make it easier to monitor your own health insurance. You can track it on your mobile phone. We make it easier for the community health worker to link up to another level in the health system to get an answer to why do I have fever? Why does a patient mm -hmm. not respond? The need for digitization and the fact that we have a Digital Health Act is something that we need to underscore. All right. I want to move forward on the issue of young people. 
Please. Something he said that women were so excited about. Mm -hmm. The issue of bringing up responsible young men yes, in indeed. society. Yes, indeed. He spoke to it and you could see that the whole house was listening. Those traction. A lot yes. of people resonated with that. Yes. It's time now for us to look again at the absentee parent, the mm -hmm. father, and say, you know, you need to come home, engage in feeding your child, doing the homework, finding out what they did in their extracurricular time. So that we bring up a community of responsible men and responsible parents, responsible citizens. And in that way, share the balance of responsibilities in the household, allowing the women also to continue to excel in their careers and around their talents, but then making sure they're not treated as second class citizens. Mm -hmm. And that's what he said that made many women happy. And he also said he had committed 100 million, I think, shillings to a new program to be undertaken by his deputy, Kithura Kindiki, mm -hmm. on addressing ending gender-based violence. That's right. And he spoke about putting in units in police stations and other places like health facilities that would look at and track gender-based violence as it presents. Mm -hmm. And more than that, he talked about having a collaborative venture that would reach out across sectors to address the issue of not just gender-based violence, but femicide. Mm -hmm. And what did he say on femicide, which people were listening to? He said, these cases are being investigated and to his knowledge, people have been charged. Mm -hmm. We need to hear more about that. I think this was something that young people are alive to, especially young women and parents. Right. So yes, it was a very interesting debate this interesting. afternoon. Yeah. Yes. And, and there was a, something there, oh, you wanna chip in? And I want to continue from uh, elsewhere. One of uh, the critical things that the president uh, moved to deal with was the issue of abductions. Mm -hmm. He decided to face it head on. Mm -hmm. You know, there has been this general antitrons that uh, he might be instructing those things to happen or he might be protecting certain people. So he decided today to declare that whoever is carrying out criminal activities is doing them at their own levels. And therefore, they are going to be held responsible and accountable for their actions. It's the same case with the way he pointed out on the withdrawal of cases, corruption cases. That if the DPP and the DCI are not in, in investigating properly, it's their responsibility. And if they're unable to perform, I'm very sure that he's going to take action on that. So generally, the president demonstrated that whoever has been given a responsibility is supposed to execute it without necessarily trying to imply that he might face some kind of interference. So I think that's a very positive note and very promising for Kenyans. Right. Professor, on, on, just as you chip in, I want you to help us with something. It's been a criticism of the Kenyan uh, education system mm -hmm. that it is either um, you know, inefficient or underfunded, that it is training uh, people for the wrong things, mm -hmm. for the wrong era. Mm -hmm. uh, in your opinion, and as an educationist mm -hmm. uh, of, of long standing, would you say that our education system is preparing our children or our, our learners for the world that they live in and the world that they will live in to compete with those Asian tigers that we're talking about, the Singapores of this world? No, uh, Victor, our education system need a major surgery. Uh, and you've got problems with funding now. Uh, well, funding model. Funding. Uh, you're funding for what? Um, you have to create idea. Mm. first and then secondly decide what is it you want to find. A friend of mine, uh, and we are very close, uh, Professor Ulubai Ulubai, um, who, who retired from Rutgers University and is working very close with me. Uh, President Goodluck of Nigeria has just invited him to help them shape higher education system in Nigeria because they're trying so many things they're not going uh, anywhere. Let me give you three ingredients. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that is what I wanted to hear from the president. That will change the shape of this country and the shape of education. Number one is accessible education for all. Uh, there is no one single country in this world that has developed without accessible to education for all. Mm -hmm. From preschool, all the way to adult learning, mm -hmm. uh, so that they have material, they have understanding, uh, they can articulate issues regarding their life and their about citizen. Number two, we don't need to fund all universities on the same basis. Mm. 
we need to fund or invest in a, uh, 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 in, in a certain pattern, certain way. We need to create highly selective, highly merit universities, whether it is one, whether it's two, whether it's three, because we have kids that are coming uh, and, and highly motivated, highly creative, and performing very well. And we put them uh, just in anywhere, and then they lose hope, they lose creativity, they lose everything. Mm. Thirdly, and uh, then I'll come back to number two, thirdly is what you call inclusive institution. Uh, the main determinant of our economic uh, level is we are able to bring everybody from, from gender to handicap to every inclusive education. Uh, so the structure to promote the broad-based participation of our people. Let me get back to number two, because this is really important. They are assessment of the best universities in the world. And US always number one. And then in, in the UK, there is only two universities. That's Oxford and, and Cambridge. Cambridge. The rest of the world follow. In Africa, there's nothing except South Africa, where they had created like uh, University of Cape Town. Mm -hmm. And so the kind of things we have, you, you just watch Moi University right now, and you cry and just imagine how much money Mm -hmm. The public has invested in more university because we're just creating. You know, I, I've been vice chancellor here for ten years, mm -hmm. uh, and I left. I took a small university that was struggling, and we left it a very vibrant university. And by the time, by let me tell you, that my last five years, we challenged the student that we will have a millionaire every single year, and there were three millionaires by the time I left who are students at the university. So highly mer merit university, like MIT, okay, okay? like Stanford. Right. Okay. Uh, those are the ones that drive the economy. Mm -hmm. So let us not forget, uh, right now we have a, a question, and I'm, I want to talk very broadly uh, about this thing. The pi people in charge of, of education in Kenya, Mm -hmm. uh, would you put them in charge of education when you're looking at Singapore and you're looking at South Korea? You know, so, so what, what exactly are we doing? All right. And we, where, where do we want to go? All right. I like that question, heavy questions. Now, folks, I want us to, to do things a little bit differently in, in this home stretch. We, we had the president. We had what he said. I want to hear from you. I want to hear what you think should have been addressed, each of you, one point that you think should have been addressed. And I want you to perhaps chart the way forward over the next 12 months until the next State of the Nation address. All right? I want to start with you, Fomba. What should he have addressed and what do you expect or what do you want to be addressed in the next 12, 12 months? He should have put more serious commitment on the aspect of uh, having corrupt people being tried and being, the case being decided within six months. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I expect the majority leader to take up that role and introduce the bill in parliament so that it's a serious action that within six months, every corruption case should have been dealt with and been finalized and been uh, decided. All right, but, but you're saying that the Chief Justice is complaining that the judiciary is underfunded. In, is underfunded. The investigative agencies are complaining about lack of resources. It, it, Police stations don't even have secluded about, places for GBV victims. About money generally, all of us are complaining that there's uh, limited money. And the president said we are supposed to live within our means. <laughs> like you understand, uh, we are all constrained. Okay. Look at all over the world, there are economic challenges. We are not uh, in exclusion. All of us are victims of the global challenges of COVID-19 and even the war in Europe, he mentioned that. And despite that, remember, Kenya is among the best countries that are developing in terms of economic growth. So the challenges of money will always be there, but we must cut down on corruption or just get rid of it. And the way to get rid of it is ensuring that it is totally punitive for any, people, any person who is involved in corruption. 
All so right. all those points relate to each other. They are supposed to work hand in hand and complement each other. All right. Yes. Reverend, from where yes. you sit, what mm -hmm. should he have addressed and what do you expect to happen or should, to, uh, should happen between now and the next State of the Nation address? Um, from where I sit, uh, he should have been candid enough to tell us how he's going to deal with these issues that we have been raising all along. Yes, he, he mentioned issues around abduction and, and all that, but uh, the common Mwanainchi is looking for something that is tangible. Making this simple and easy to understand from a common person uh, perspective is what I wanted to have had. Something to do with the taxation. The taxes have been going up, up, added here and there, introduced all at, at a go. And um, the common person is still not able to translate that into a service delivery, into something that is lowering down the cost of, uh, of living. That's what the common person is looking into. So that was missing? That is missing. What would you expect state. in the next 12 months? What uh, should be there? What's the ideal? Yes, I expect him to come again and tell the public how he's going to handle this issue. Because telling people that uh, the economy uh, is going to improve has, uh, has improved. Uh, somebody who is not able to buy food, and they were able to buy food sometimes back, it has to be translated mm -hmm. into simple, what direct. Into simple, direct, and easy to understand language. For economists, for accountants, for um, you know, the elites, they are able okay. to understand what the president is saying. But the majority of Kenyans are not in that category. All right. The majority on, in Kenya want to know what have you said about this employment in right. simple terms? Okay. What have you said about this education issue okay. right. in simple terms? What is it that you are saying about this shift? Mm -hmm. uh, how, how is it different from NHIF and how is it going to be helpful? In simple terms. In simple terms. And right. let us know mm -hmm. why, if it is that good, why are people dying in the hospital today? If it is that good, why, how come the, those who had uh, paid money to, like somebody said during that time, somebody was saying that I've paid this money for the last 11 years, I've never been sick, what, what have you, where has my money gone to? Mm -hmm. Because when I went now to the shift, uh, shifted to shift, I realized that uh, they are saying mine is zero. Zero, okay. So how, how do you explain that? How do you reconcile in that in simple terms right. to right. the common Mwanainchi? Mm -hmm. Because where, from where I sit, I say, that is in the church, in the village, in the city, in the slums, um, we are with commoners mm -hmm. who want to see tangible things. All right. They don't want to hear rhetorics. Right. If you are dealing with corruption, mm -hmm. who, who has tied your hands? Okay. Because that is the big question. Okay. It was said during President Uhuru, two billion every day. It is being repeated by, by Honourable Mbadi, by Honorable Mbadi uh, which I highly doubt. Is it really two billion? How come it is static? Mm. All right. So, and who has tied their hands from dealing with such cases? All right. All the, right. way, the way okay. Parliament is dealing with the, the, the impeachment motions, this is the same way they should deal swiftly with issues of corruption. All right. I heard of a, a blame uh, to the judiciary, that it is the judiciary that is taking too, too long. Uh, I doubt that, because somebody somewhere is the one who was given the tools of authority and power. So let us, let us translate this to the common monainchi in a way that it is going to touch their lives instantly. All right. Okay. Well said. Now... Dr. Terry, from where you sit, as tight as you can, what should he have addressed 
and what do you expect or what's the ideal, what should be the ideal in the next 12 months? Quick as you can, please. There are a few things I would have liked to hear, mm -hmm. but I must admit that you know, a human being can only do so much in one year mm -hmm. or six months or even a term of the presidency. Okay. But if it were possible, more on public-private partnership. Mm -hmm. We need to let the commoner or the one inch at large and the leadership understand what we mean by PPP. Mm -hmm. And I think it would have been great to hear a pronouncement about parliament itself understanding what PPP is and especially the Senate. The importance is that PPP is perhaps a way forward to creating flagship projects that can employ Kenyans and address some of this unemployment that we keep hearing about. Okay. If it were possible, one would say every county should within the next six months come up with a PPP project that's a flagship. Look at what happened with the SGI. That was a flagship project funded through a PPP model. Mm -hmm. The Expressway, a flagship project funded under a PPP model. Every county should have one. Right. And the PPP unit shouldn't just be a unit in Treasury. I would say create a line ministry that is from national level through county up to community with PPP so that partnership becomes mm. part of our ethic right. okay. because the exchequer cannot do it all. Mm -hmm. Another is we need to insist on having government to government bilateral engagement to fund some of the development needs in the community. So if you have a ministry for PPP that also goes to do government to government, that would have been wonderful. Mm. Another thing, the two thirds gender rule, he brought it up. We didn't hear too much about it. We should have parliamentarians look at how they can help to work with political party systems to bring women on board to reduce mm -hmm. this difference in terms of representation through capacitating these women and preparing them for elections. Last, the issue of social solidarity. This needs to be something that Kenyans begin to espouse. This thing of being divisive, hate messaging should be faced square on. Kenyans need to be told about the unity of purpose that we can build through the cooperative movement and also through the social health insurance fund. It's a solidarity fund. You put your money there, you may not draw on it, but another Kenyan who would be sick gets to benefit. And by the way, if you're in the same community, if I'm sick, you're probably going to be sick too if it's communicable, but you're going to reduce productivity by having another sick Kenyan in your community. Social solidarity. Social sorry, solidarity. It looks as if we're talking about going back to basics, some of the things that we espoused mm -hmm. at Independence. Professor, I want to give you a, a quick chance. My director is telling me we are mm. out of time. By the way, uh, Reverend, it's now 2.2 billion lost per day, not just 2 billion. <laughs> it's gone up. Mm. No, <laughs> corruption <laughs> suffers from inflation. <laughs> Sir, Victor, if you may, quick as you can. That's Victor, please. a time has come to overhaul our education system. If we want to be an industrial nation uh, on the way, I talk about the three things mm -hmm. that need to be done. Completely overhaul the uh, funding model, completely overhaul the idea of creating university in every county mm -hmm. and create Tibet program, national Tibet program in every country and have selective uh, uh, higher education mm -hmm. that will drive the country into the future. Wow, wow, wow. Good people. We like to say the conversation was bigger than the time that we had. Yes. But I certainly uh, believe that we've had some insight tonight. And I thank you, gentlemen and lady, for giving us the insights tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been Insight Tonight. Thank you to all of you who are watching us at home. I want to say thank you to the team behind the camera, the editorial team, the camera people, the people in the gallery, everybody. Thank you so much for making this a reality. I want to say thank you for choosing us to inform you. And from all of us, we want to say good night and may God bless you.